question. So if you can, IT team can uh, put up our slides. I just wanted to share with you the 15 research report and the publication where it is and how uh, are they looking. Because somebody was asking, is it still there on or have you put that on the website? So before uh, the session by Andy, if the IT team can kindly uh, put up the slide and show the web page of the 15 research reports, please. Yeah, yeah, okay. So these, these are the reports as you would have seen in the, in the morning session. So it, you can download, download on our Connect to Recover web page. Uh, individual reports as well as the ITU publication and also you would see the video that you all contributed to so with that I won't take much of your time uh, I pass the floor to our next moderator uh, Andy from Huawei Andy the floor is yours thank you Oh, uh, thank you, Samir, Karen, and the whole of the ITU team to have made all of this possible today. It has been a journey. Uh, my name is Andy Hu I'm from Huawei. I'd be, I'm honored to be moderating uh, this last session. Uh, health, uh, education, job creation, and vulnerable persons. This uh, first four sessions uh, quite naturally bring us to this last one, uh, where we focus on digital connectivity and um, uh, digital resilience, which underpin all of the areas that uh, we have addressed so far. Uh, with uh, 2.7 billion people still unconnected, the need to bridge digital gaps and build a resilient broadband infrastructure and digital ecosystem in the global recovery process requires, I hope, little explanation. The uh, excellent panelists that uh, we have here today have each offered tailored recommendations to address existing challenges in their respective uh, case studies. I'll try to introduce uh, each panelist very quickly before giving the floor uh, to them in sequence uh, for their presentation. And we'll go for a round of questions if we have time. Um, and if time permits, a question or two from the floor before we wrap. All right, we have here with us uh, Mr. Uh, William Barraza from the African Advanced Level Telecoms Institute, uh, Afrati. Uh, Professor uh, Cameron um, from the same team. Uh, Mr. Uh, Leonard Mabelli uh, with Stratmore University in Kenya. And Ms. Uh, Danello uh, Lintumba with the University of Cape Town. Now, they each represent teams that uh, address diverse approaches and contexts in providing affordable and reliable uh, connectivity. We do want to be mindful of the time. Each speaker, speaker will have 10 minutes for their presentation. And without further ado, let's hear it from uh, William and Professor Cameron, whose team studied market resilience in com communications in Kenya between eight, uh, 2018 and 2021. William, the floor is yours. Thank you uh, very much, um, Andy, for the introduction. And also thank you, um, I hope I'm audible enough. And thank you, ITU, for sponsoring um, this um, research. Um, of course, without your facilitation, we've not been able to do this. So um, I'll go through the presentation. Um, our research was around market resilience in emerging technologies, uh, digital um, economies. And this was a case study of uh, Kenya during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the theme was actually under um, digital connectivity and resilience, as uh, Andy has alluded to it. And um, I'm with my colleague here, Professor uh, Geoffrey Gitao Kamau, uh, who will take you through the presentation. Um, so quickly, just go through the um, agenda of the presentation, just like our other uh, predecessors have uh, ex uh, presented. I'll take you through the research team, um, intro, research methodology, and my colleague will take you quickly through the findings and uh, then recommendations. So our research team, um, we are about uh, seven people, as you can see from them, uh, myself, uh, Professor uh, Kamau here, then you have Dr. John Papalika from uh, Afrati as well, and then we have uh, uh, Kobe Institute of Computing Japan, uh, Professor Yamanaka, who we collaborated with, and then uh, the rest of the team, uh, Lawrence, uh, Jonathan, and Steve, are indicated. Um, so in the introduction, um, obviously this was a response to the competition that was um, issued by uh, ITU in terms of um, trying to find out how the markets responded to the pandemic when it occurred. And we know very well that Africa was one of the economies that um, countries in Africa were the one who economies that were really impacted negatively by the pandemic. Um, so when you look at the shocks that um, really um, affected Africa 
among them being the fact that uh, governments took um, a lot of um, drastic actions to prevent the spread of the pandemic, including closure of schools, uh, closure of businesses. Um, some uh, countries actually issued um, uh, curfews where people could not move. Uh, this really impacted on uh, communication and interaction between um, um, human beings as we, as we knew it. Um, so uh, in, in, in just conclusion, the underlying issues uh, include the persistent skills gap uh, in digital literacy, uh, service affordability, um, consumer protection and return uh, on investment for service providers. Um, so therefore, this research was to establish uh, what was the country's, especially Kenya, what, which was a case study situation on, on, of East Market resilience in communications, and how was this uh, exacerbated by the pandemic. I've just, I've just explained some of the issues that uh, caused uh, the closure of uh, some businesses, and what responses were undertaken um, by the, the economies uh, in question. How did this impact uh, on the market res resilience uh, of the pandemic of the of future pandemics um, on the research met methodology we had we used a mix uh, research um, and uh, what we did was we we had uh, questionnaires sent out to various organizations including uh, private sector uh, government mainly government because it was the one that involved in uh, responding to the the pandemic and also um, uh, in NGOs um, so, and then we had a, a sample frame of one, one of four um, multi-sectoral COVID-19 response institutions in Kenya. And then uh, census method was used uh, to collect primary data uh, from 83 uh, accessible units. Um, and then data collection instruments were structured questionnaires. We had interviews uh, via telephone calls because at that time also we could not interact with, uh, in person when we, we did the, the research. We also, had, we also went through secondary data uh, collection uh, through various um, organizations, including, as I mentioned, World Bank, um, the Central Bank of Kenya, Kenya National Bureau of Statistics, and the Communication Authority. Uh, we also had um, qualitative, as I mentioned, we did a mixed research uh, method, um, qualitative data collected, um, which was summarized in two uh, dimensional matrices, um, text map, and uh, SMR model. Uh, the quantitative data uh, was analyzed and presented in description uh, statistics um, and in charts and distribution um, tables. So this is actually in, in our report. If you look at what um, has been shared by ITU on the portal, uh, all this is available in the detailed uh, report. So at this uh, stage, I'll hand over to my colleague to take us through the findings um, and then the recommendations. Thank you very much, William. Uh, my name is Professor Gitau Kamau. I'm consulting for Afrati and also in the academia at the Zitek University. So I'll continue where my colleague has, has reached. And um, I'll start by a comment that was made by one of the respondents who said that uh, nowadays people post discoveries of tourism places not known before, for instance, Oroko Mountain in the little explored in northeastern Kenya. This was uh, a statement that was made by uh, one of the respondents from Kenya Professional Safari uh, Guides Association. And so we could argue that um, uh, in this particular study, uh, the research methods, uh, yeah. um, uh, the, the initial market resilience of Kenya when uh, the, the, the COVID-19 uh, occurred, uh, after the analysis, it, is, it, it, it is scored as uh, two out of five, uh, which was an indication that uh, it was moderate. And uh, when you look at that score, uh, two out of five, uh, though moderate, it means that it was not satisfactory. And actually, our findings were that uh, the weakest link, uh, because Kenya is, uh, has a devolved government, was actually in the in the devolved units of the government. And um, uh, during that period uh, of the COVID-19, the, the GDP of Kenya, the GDP of Kenya, uh, really contracted by about three, uh, 0 0.3 percent. Uh, and this uh, is compared to the revised growth that we had encountered in the previous year of 5% in the 2019. So it means that uh, COVID-19 actually negatively impacted on the growth of Kenya. And uh, it caused increased pressure on um, uh, the communication services uh, such that uh, there was increased uh, traffic in money, money transfer, uh, in mobile broadband connectivity, especially because people are working from home in courier services because people would not face a credit travel and therefore uh, transportation of goods would have to be done through courier uh, services and be able to show how that uh, really impacted on the market resilience. And it also caused a market reduction in the fixed data because people would not access their fixed data from offices 
and they actually moved to broadband uh, mobile data. Uh, it also affected the local international calls because uh, well, most of these calls now are not being made. And uh, the responses that were taken by the, by the government in various models, we evaluated them and we found that uh, in the end, they helped to improve the market resilience of the country from two to three, uh, which meant that country became, and at the moment, is now uh, more robust than it was before. And we used an analysis of a model called the LIPIC model, uh, which we, we, we is demonstrated within our report. And uh, the specific responses that we found that were very effective in the response that government had took, one was the medical protocols and the travel restrictions as well, the tax reliefs that were given to the businesses and the individuals, and also the question of innovations that came up from the business communities. Uh, we did find that uh, the, broad, uh, the broadband infrastructure was absolutely very critical uh, in the handling of emergencies uh, and uh, continuity of business and resilience of the economy during this particular period. And uh, therefore, we do say that um, uh, 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 for the emerging economies uh, to be able to become resilient going forward, uh, they need to put a lot of uh, uh, focus on uh, the broadband telecommunications and ICT infrastructure so that future pandemics will not uh, have any impact on them. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, one of our recommendations is that going forward, emerging economies like Kenya should be able to intensify on their telecommunications and ICT infra infrastructures so that uh, future pandemics will be able to uh, not, will not uh, impact on them so heavily and they'll be resilient enough to be able to provide emergency communication and services uh, for continuity of businesses if uh, another pandemic comes up. And uh, we also do recommend that uh, emergency essential value chains uh, should be identified, which should be continued regardless of whether it's pandemic or not because they are critical for humanity. And their contingencies should be defined by law, therefore they are mainstreamed and, uh, and, uh, and put within the, the, the policy structures and legal structures so that there are policies and regulations that would work best to make sure that this is maintained regardless of any pandemic or any disruptions. We do also recommend the, uh, our communication authority that should consider allocating spectrum that has been freed from te uh, technologies that have been uh, reformed, uh, particularly when we talk about the moving from uh, the analog to digital, which has released uh, some uh, spectrum. The same can be released to communities that are in their unserved areas to provide radio stations and other services to be used for the vulnerable in case of an emergency like the COVID-19. Uh, we also do recommend that the innovations that were undertaken uh, uh, by the locals, because they, when they realized that they cannot manage to access the international market to buy some of the critical resources that were required in response to COVID-19, they went into innovating their own. And therefore, we do recommend that the same uh, ecosystem and framework should be, should be strengthened within the country for it to be able to produce its own uh, innovations to one's uh, emergency responses and telecommunication service and business continuity. We also do feel that uh, some technologies uh, uh, that, were, that were very useful in the driving of the economy during this time, the particularly the issue of telecommuting, it should be a strengthened, uh, not just as a stopgap measure, but maybe a permanent uh, practice within our country that can move most of our economy away from uh, the tradition of physical uh, into cashless and other uh, virtual uh, uh, driven uh, uh, business uh, practices. And uh, we did find that there was hate and issues of cyber security that occurred in our country because having known that businesses who are in the digital space, uh, a lot of uh, opportunists uh, went into attacking our digital systems and data. And therefore, we, we recommend uh, enhancing and strengthening of data protection uh, uh, so that uh, the, the, the conversion into uh, the digital presence will be secured. Uh, Kamal, I think that's only uh, the, all the time that we have. So I'm going to have to cut you off there. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, intensifying telecoms. <laughs> intensifying uh, telecoms and IT, ICT infrastructure has become, as the gentleman have suggested, a practical necessity. Now, now as, uh, as we will be hearing in a minute, uh, this is critical for not just emerging economies as a whole, but also in the case of Kenya, uh, for specific rural counties uh, where uh, challenges persist in both the utilization and affordability uh, of existing fiber resources. Uh, Leonard, please take it away. Good afternoon. I hope you can all hear me. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot, Andy, and thanks a lot, the team of ITU, for making this possible, together with the partners like Huawei, the governments of Japan, Saudi Arabia, and Australia as well. So our research was, uh, with, with the Monica's research paper four, was on COVID-19 recovery. So basically what we're looking at here is a three-pronged approach 
where we assess the state of connectivity for the rural counties before the pandemic, during the pandemic, and now what is after the call on rebuilding digital inclusion. That means after, what will happen? What are the mechanisms that can be put in place to be able to enable connectivity for these rural counties? So my name is Leonard Mabele. I'm from Strathmore University. Um, and I don't have the presentation. Oh, thanks. Yeah, so I'm going to skip this slide because all of us have seen it over and over. It's um, moving to the next one. So uh, this is the research team. Um, so the, we, we had quite a big research team coming from the four institutions, if you can see the logos there. And it's a good research that combined academia and the regulator. And, and the academia was a university, two universities from Kenya, Strathmore University, Technical University of Kenya, and then another university from the UK, Scotland, the University of Glasgow, and then the Communications Authority of Kenya. And I just want to note that uh, in this room, at least, we have representatives from Communications Authority of Kenya who are also research partners on this. Uh, Dr. Gilbert Mugeni, who's the second one there, uh, he can raise his hand. And then, uh, apart from Dr. Mugeni, we also have a representative from, from the Communications Authority, who's the director, who's one of the directors of the Communications Authority, Mr. Peter Wanjau. Wanjau, he was also here. Uh, and then, so the research leads, the other research lead was Professor Edward Wasige from Glasgow, and then Dr. Kennedy Rono from Technical University of Kenya. So the background is, we. Just in March 2020, when COVID had just hit, the government went into lockdown and shut down all the schools. That means the physical uh, distancing was coming into place, and schools could no longer continue going to, you know, having physical uh, interactions. And that affected 18 million Kenyans, 18 million students. Now, a, a very interesting scenario, and I think Ms. Anne Rochelle had alluded to it, alluded to it earlier on, is Kenya's 70% of the population is, is found in the rural areas. So if you're talking about 18 million students locked out of physical interaction, then we're talking about a bigger percentage of those who had now to resort to online learning. So that formed uh, pretty much a basis of us trying to find out what was their state of continuity in terms of learning. And then apart from the schools, we also looked at the healthcare institutions, to which that was coming from a point of, we felt like uh, coming from the government statistics, there was a disconnect in terms of information sharing. So we just wanted to determine uh, how was the state of connectivity to really guarantee you know, continuity during the COVID, the pandemic, for the healthcare institutions to continue with their, with their services? Uh, and then with this kind of approach, we, we, we were looking at, we started investigating the state of connectivity before the pandemic, and then the state of connectivity during the pandemic. So in this context, it means which is how many schools had really put in place you know, backup mechanisms to just ensure, OK, nothing has changed. We can just move online and continue learning. And the same for healthcare. Now, uh, so we focused on two rural counties. Even though I looked at schools and, and healthcare institutions, we looked at two rural counties. And our rationale for the two rural counties, which one of them was Kakamega County, is because Kakamega County is the most populous rural county in Kenya. And then the second county is Trukana. So Trukana is, is one of the arid and semi-arid counties of Kenya, and it's pretty much the second largest in size in the country. So the two formed, the rationale formed our, our focus of the two counties. Uh, and then, Beyond that, also some of the things that formed that part of the background was what regulatory developments had been put in place to be able to keep connectivity going, and what was the regulator doing even prior to the pandemic to ensure that connectivity was not disrupted for the learners and the healthcare institutions. So this uh, formed the background of our study. And then moving on to Our research methodology. So we largely leveraged the desk research, and this was really key to us because I think just towards within 2020, ITU had just released a document of last mile connectivity solutions guide. And look, talking about rural counties, for us, this was last mile connectivity we are talking about. And so we spent a lot of time studying some of the documents that had been put in place, the regulatory frameworks, documents that came from you know ITU and global connectivity stats, 
uh, rural connectivity as articulated or postulated by the government, uh, including the digital blueprint that the government had just rolled out, as well as the national broadband strategy. So that, that largely was desk research, just us trying to find that out. And then the two, next we did a site survey. So after that, we went to the two counties. Uh, we replaced Trukana with Kakamega. I mean, we, we replaced Trukana with Machakos because Trukana being very far away from Nairobi, you know, and the budget limitations and constraints, we couldn't get to go there. So we replaced with another county just to see what the metrics looked like. And then another approach of study to this was stakeholder engagement. So in this context, how was it for the internet service providers? Did COVID give them an opportunity to keep their business going? Did it hamper it? How was it like, and particularly for the two counties that we had put for this, for this study? And then beyond that, the last item on the methodology was spectrum measurement. So what, what we had to do this was, was there an opportunity that spectrum was being underutilized by the ISPs or the incumbents in other bands? So we had to conduct a spectrum measurements together uh, with the communications authority. Uh, Leonard, I'm going to have to ask you to speed up just a little. Thank oh, you. Oh, sorry. Uh, I think I have like three slides. So our research findings are this. So it, it, it became clear that most schools and healthcare facilities were significantly affected, affected by the pandemic. But then there are also challenges of some of them were close to connectivity, like fiber, but they couldn't reach it, which brought the issues of dark fiber. And then ISPs mentioned some of the challenges they had faced earlier on in terms of power, making sure that that can sustain the schools in the rural areas. And we also had institutions who needed outdoor Wi-Fi, but was not there. Uh, and then this comes to our recommendations. So our recommendations, the first one, and it pretty much ties to the GIGA project of the IT was, we have to contextually map the connectivity needs versus the infrastructure coverage in the country. And I'm glad that that's a conversation that Mr. Samia and, and Ms. Uh, Munu was presenting earlier on, on open data. So we saw that that's something you're recommending. And we also recommend that immediately the opportunity of dark fiber be exploited. Like we get to have, uh, if there is a need that we could collaborate to have connectivity reach the institutions that are close to the points of dark fiber, that would be great. And also we have recommendations of community networks and others, but all these are articulated in our general report that is available on the site, as Mr. Sami has mentioned. And then here for our conclusion is just, is this like the near future studies need to exploit the dark fiber. There are quite a number of other high points on that, but I think that's the beginning point that we think will kick off from this. And I'm glad that we are already talking to Huawei to be able to start doing something, implementing something of this study. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Leonard. Uh, now, in closing the digital gap, some have proposed to examine uh, the concept of community networks as a means to leverage digital. Our last speaker represents a team across three different continents. Ms. Uh, Danilo, over to you. very much. I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, my name is Ndine Lao and I will be representing research paper five, which is titled a community-based uh, vision for local resilient networks. And uh, so our project, it's, it's a mutual sharing of uh, experiences and uh, challenges learning between two community wireless networks. Uh, Janastu in India and Black Equations in Ocean View in Cape Town in South Africa. So these are my research uh, team members. Uh, we are an international uh, team. We have uh, participants. Um, I mean, we have colleagues from the UK, um, India and South Africa. And so we are made of Hanif, Tibi Danish, Nevo, Naveen, and Melissa as our co-investigators, and Daisy, myself, Ndinalao, and Sidant as research assistants. Um, so I'm going to introduce our community partners. I'm just going to play these two short uh, minute videos.
My name is Hadi Flanio, and I operate the Community Networking Ocean View. Together with UCD, the network started as a research project, and over the past three years, from a research project into a business. Our focus initially was on providing free digital content over our network. But as time went on, we received more and more requests to make internet access available as well. Today, we have 20 hotspots spread out all over the community and phase one is almost complete. So now that our people have internet access, our focus is shifting to meaningful connectivity. What do you do with internet access? Putting the skills that we are learning from these workshops into practice, we, we know that this network will be a catalyst uh, for the socio-economic development of our community. And we thank you for your support. Um, my name is Dinesh and uh, we started working on uh, what might now be called as community networks uh, some decade ago and uh, the whole history behind why we started it as one of the important things for our organizations as going forward. Uh, now we are using Libre routers, open source frameworks and um, applications that we think are close to what our villagers need and we set up a rural research lab so the technology relevant to this work can be uh, addressed in it and uh, here is our team Mrs. is Sanke, who's a technology hardware guy at Shalini who's been the holder of many strings and Shafali the design input and Mukunda is the youngest of the uh, team with a lot of enthusiasm and um, yeah, and uh, we were very excited to get the ITC pro ITU project as uh, is bringing two different network builders and similar concerns and uh, the way we want to go forward post COVID. And we're bringing designers and meeting each other and re re -look, re having a relook at what we're doing on both sides. And we learned a lot, which is a sign of success. Spence as follow. We started with 25 uh, uh, interviews. Dinamo, uh, the uh, ITU General Secretary General elect is about to be online, so we will kindly suggest that uh, we continue the presentation uh, after um, her segment. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that part of the discussion. We'd always uncover uh, more questions in seeking the right answers, but uh, this would be all the time that we have before uh, the segment from uh, Mr. Reem Bagdad Martin. <laughs> Um, I want to conclude uh, for now uh, uh, by thanking all of you for a, rel uh, for a relevant, uh, timely, and uh, very interesting session. And with that, I'd like to thank you again and hand back to uh, the ITU team, Ms. Henry Cowell. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy. I've been in and out, out but um, I'd like to say congratulations for to all of you and for great sessions so far. Uh, so. Now we're going to hear uh, from um, our the ITUs, the International Telecommunication Union's um, uh, director of the Bureau of um, Development and also Secretary uh, General Elect at ITU. Uh, we're very proud of this development. Doreen is the first woman to be at the helm of the ITU in. 157 years. So join me in uh, welcoming Doreen online and uh, hopefully some of you will have the opportunity to also meet her in person tomorrow. She's arriving only tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs> Doreen, if you can hear me, the floor is yours.
Sorry, somebody has to unmute her and uh, Yeah, video too. Apologies for this, but I think we've all lived this for the past three years under COVID. <laughs> oh, Rachel, we're going to, uh, yeah, that's, that's why. Rachel? Yeah. Uh, Rachel is here. I'm doing. I don't think I'm going to So. Uh, okay. Uh, Rachel, is she connected? Um, with um, BDT director. Okay, we can see her. I mean, we can see BDT director. Here we go. Okay. Okay, I'm here. Can you hear me? Absolutely, yes. loud and clear. Yes, we can. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, apologies, apologies for that. Excellencies, uh, distinguished colleagues, ladies, and, and gentlemen. Uh, let me start by, by thanking you for your, uh, what I understand has been active and very engaging participation in this session, uh, best practices and recommendations for digital inclusion through resilience infrastructure. Um, I think we have heard throughout today, the day zero sessions, the importance of resilience, and of course the impact that COVID has had as an accelerator for the digital, and of course as a tool for, for recovery. Uh, I do want to express my, uh, my deep appreciation for Australia's support on the Connect to Recover uh, steering committee, uh, particularly to the Asia Pacific region, and of course for the presence of uh, Her Excellency Ambassador Julia. I think she's she's with us. Um, of course, also want to to welcome his his Excellency Minister Mola. Uh, thank him also for uh, for his support and his uh, his remarks um, as we have launched our 15 Connect to Recover reports and of course the ITU's own publication Build Back Better with Broadband research stories from, from the front line. Um, I also want to acknowledge the invaluable support of the government of Japan. Uh, they stepped forward uh, at the height of the pandemic to become one of our Connect to, to Recover founding, founding partners. Um, my gratitude, of course, is also to Huawei uh, for its great support of this important research competition, uh, and in particular to Carl Song, and to Philippe, uh, Philippe Wang for their insightful remarks. Um, also, thank you to uh, Professor Sharifat, uh, who uh, I believe joined from, from Geneva today, and of course my colleague, uh, Dr. Cosmos Zava Zava. Um, they both spent much time in uh, reviewing the contributions for the research competition. Um, the findings that were published today I think they will serve as an invaluable resource for stakeholders, uh, for stakeholders around the world that are working to strive to make digital ecosystems more resilient, um, as well as more inclusive. Uh, these findings demonstrate just how urgent universal connectivity is. Uh, and of course, especially in, uh, in the rural, uh, hardest to get to areas. Um, they also underscore the importance of digital services, uh, services like telemedicine, uh, online learning, e-business, digital payments, and how they can enhance lives and be transformative. Uh, but of course, these solutions can only come about uh, when we have strong partnerships and strong participation from different stakeholders. Uh, the findings also reaffirm that our mission 
can't be limited to just the infrastructure piece. It also needs to include uh, the needs of those at the edge of the network, uh, the communities, the users, and of course, vulnerable, vulnerable persons. Um, it, the needs in terms of um, a focus on digital skills was also uh, a key component of, of the findings and of course, institutional and human capacity building. Uh, and in all of the findings, I think one, one thing that came out quite clearly is the importance of having that enabling policy and regulatory environment, absolutely a, a critical piece to, um, to any sustainable development strategy. I hope you also found that the ITU UNESCO Broadband Commission report uh, on smartphone access, as well as the ITU World Bank Open Data Initiative I hope you have found that useful. Um, it's a perfect complement. That's the way we see it in terms of our connect to recover mission. Um, as many of you probably know, we concluded the ITU Plenipotentiary Conference just a couple of weeks ago in, uh, in Romania. Uh, and the outcome of that conference reinforced the commitment of our members uh, to the efforts around sustainable digital transformation. And I would say including the ongoing efforts to bridge the digital divide, of course, to promote digital gender equality and to support and nurture digital economies and societies, and of course, build back better from the pandemic. Um, I want to encourage you to consider the recommendations that have been put forward in these reports. Think about ways that they can, they can be applied um, nationally, but of course in local context. Uh, and of course, let's work together to develop implementation plans that will accelerate digital transformation and inclusion in all of our countries and communities. I think by working together, only by working together, uh, we will achieve our 17 sustainable development goals and their promise of a more prosperous, peaceful and equitable world that ensures that communities everywhere are equipped with strong and resilient digital infrastructure to withstand any kind of crisis that may hit us in the future. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Again, I apologize for interrupting your important session, but thanks for the opportunity to share a few words with you. And as Anne Rochelle mentioned, I will be with you in person tomorrow, and I look forward to that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doreen, for inspiring words, and uh, we can't wait to have you around. So uh, thanks again. And I would like to ask everybody online if you can put your uh, videos on so maybe we can capture um, a picture of you all there. That would be fantastic. All right. Yeah, they're all coming. Wonderful. <laughs> Great. A few more, come on. <laughs> Please let us know when it's done. done. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right, I think I'm going to hand the floor back to Andy. Thank you, uh, Raquel. Um, thank you. Um, I think we uh, left it at um, Dinesh's, at the conclusion of Dinesh's video from um, from Daniela. So if we could uh, kindly resume your introduction of your uh, pre uh, your presentation, please. Thank you. Okay, do I keep right? Uh, okay. Okay, so I think we were done with the video. <laughs> yeah. 
Yes. Okay. So yeah. So this is our project timeline. Uh, so it spans as follow. We started with uh, 25 interviews um, with community network uh, users um, and prospective and local network operators within the community networks that we are working with in India and in South Africa. And thereafter, the interviews were followed by um, two sets of workshops that were um, actually aimed and designed to uh, investigate what uh, community resilience for community networks is and what it means for the community members. Um, so this was done from um, a speculative futuring point and network management uh, futuring point, um, as well as an eye towards how community networks can be leveraged for local content creation um, in our communities uh, via community wireless networks. So for the speculative design part of our study, uh, we had uh, workshops uh, in both sites in India and in South Africa, um, same protocol. And these were designed to understand the idea of network resilience within the communities. And so the purpose of this was to identify both the strengths and the challenges within uh, the network in the community. So we gave our participants um, three premises. I think the first one was, what if we have uh, COVID 2025 in future and it's worse than the current pandemic and we need to go in another lockdown. And the second one was, what if the local network operators, the people that are currently managing the network leave town or they, they go to another country, um, how will the community uh, go through these problems and how will you as a community carry on to manage and sustain the network? And uh, some of the insights and findings that really came up was that the communities are really relying on the community network uh, to support them through uh, various online activities, such as supporting them in online education and finding jobs online, uh, just to mention a few. And they felt that uh, they need more training and to involve more community members into the management of the network and into how the network is running. Um, yes. So for the network management um, for community wireless networks, um, we we'll did this study with, again, current um, local network operators, the people that are managing these community wireless networks, as well as the prospective network operators. And so the key, um, the key main aim for this was to find out what are the current network management challenges, what are the experiences um, with network management in this two community wireless networks. And we then prototyped some of the solutions, of course, after identifying the problem, some of the solutions that uh, can improve or make network management easier for these communities. So some of the findings that we really um, found was that the, there are so many challenges that the local community um, or network operators uh, face when using the existing network management interfaces, how it is difficult for them to navigate through uh, these network management interfaces. Um, it's difficult for them to find connected devices and uh, not only the hotspots, but also uh, the users that are on the network. And of course, these existing network management interfaces, um, they were developed for experts. So they also struggle to get through some of the terminologies that are used on these interfaces, as well as I think we found that they have access to an ecosystem of experts and formal and informal uh, training from different organizations. And of course, there are, I think, power cuts and power issues was mentioned a lot. Um, today that that also uh, inter interrupts uh, the controllers of these networks and that also makes it difficult for them to manage the network effectively as well as the ad hoc equipments uh, 
that these community wireless networks are using, that they currently have a lot of different diverse uh, network equipments, and it's very difficult for them to catch up on this, uh, on how to manage and to use these equipments without training and um, troubleshooting resources uh, are quite also very hard for them to understand. And um, the third part of our Mr. work L, um, was- uh, Please speed up. I think we, that is all the time that we have, but uh, shall we close or uh, one more minute? Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so the last part we had content creation and dissemination workshops that we also facilitated with community members to co-create and co-produce content with them and to find out what content are they interested in in the community and what content they want to share. And we used um, a puppet software uh, during the workshop that was used to foster um, content creation is an artifact that they use. So they went in the community and they uh, created content and we uploaded their content on the software. And some of the findings from this were that the communities are really interested in having community podcasts or a platform where they can use to share um, their knowledge and community news. So lastly, uh, in conclusion, uh, I think our recommendations are really at how we need to rethink network management interfaces uh, when it comes to the usability and configurability, as well as how we can further support local content creation in communities, not only by giving communities platform to add um, their content, but also uh, helping them through the creation and co-production of this content. Thank you. Thank you, Danilo. Well, thank you, Danilo, and I deeply appreciate the patience of you all. Uh, this is a truly global session comprised of reports with actionable and original recommendations. I'd like to propose another round of applause for the four speakers and head back to the IGT. mics are very sensitive. <clears throat> Thank you all very much for um, absolutely great uh, discussions. So the last part of the day is a panel discussion. And I truly hope that um, you will all participate in making sure that uh, our panelists uh, get uh, most excruciating questions. Because uh, <laughs> We, we need to get out of here with something, all of us. So um, I would like to thank all of the presenters who have been with us today. Uh, so now I would like to um, welcome our panelists that uh, have been drawn for the from the five research themes, namely digital inclusion, health, uh, digital inclusion in education and digital inclusion in job creation and also digital inclusion for vulnerable people, vulnerable persons, as we say, and digital connectivity and resilience. So allow me and uh, please welcome with me, Mr. David Bocci, who is the senior lecturer at Brunel University, United Kingdom. And uh, he is with uh, digital inclusion in health. What, well, you need to get a mic, so if you can sit in the front, that would be great, David. Thank you. Mr. Michael Canaris, advisor, Step Up Consulting from the Philippines, and uh, he's with Digital Inclusion Education. We have Mr. Turnston Jelinek, director and senior fellow, Tev Universe Institute in China and uh, he's from the Digital Inclusion Job Creation, and Dr. Manian Kalyanan, Associate Professor at School of Business, University of Nottingham, Malaysia. Good to have you all. And, oh, yeah. 
I guess um, I'm missing someone. Yes, Ms. Dinelao Litumba, Master Student, Department of Computer Science, University of Cape Town, South Africa. The most important one because she's the only lady on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> So um, thank you all for, uh, for being here. And um, we're going to start with the first round of questions and um, uh, based on the presentations and discussions today, what do you think are some of the pressing issues that require immediate action and attention in the sector and research themes that you have all discussed today? So um, I'll give two minutes for each panelist and um, this is very democratic. We're multi-stakeholder. So um, the one who says me first goes. <laughs> Please, David, go ahead. Yeah, um, with regards to the digital inclusivity with, uh, uh, from the health team perspective, mm -hmm. one thing we, I observe is that across board, the emphasis is on rural communities and the ability for telemedicine to actually get to the rural communities. And so you see that there are uh, some of my colleagues who are uh, the panelists actually were actually finding solutions as to how to reach people in those remote communities. But very importantly is the fact that across board, there is no proper structure with regards to a digital policy, for instance, that will guide you know, an inclusive and implementable, you know, telemedicine system in, in, in Africa and for that matter, other parts of the globe. I'm sure in the advanced countries, there are some available, but in the global south, it's, I think we seldom find some of these policies available. So I think the first step is to actually identify some of these, uh, because once we're able to get that, it gives us the guidelines as to exactly how to approach making sure that telemedicine actually gets to those at the base of the pyramid. And I think uh, if, if we can do this, then <clears throat> issues relating to the ethical implications of telemedicine, for instance, the governance aspect of telemedicine, for instance, all these things will be captured in, 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 in such type of policies. Yeah. Thank you very much, David. I appreciate that. And uh, I'm going to say, please keep in mind uh, Samir and colleagues will have to send you some information about some of the what is happening around smart villages, for example, at ITU, because there's been the same type of discussion in some of the countries where we started smart villages. We do have people, for example, who have had um, premises of those digital policies that you're talking about by implementation on the ground so that, you know, it is really truly informed. So keep that in mind. Who goes next? Can, yes. can, I, can I go next? Yeah. Please, buddy. Uh, thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, in our session, session number four, for the vulnerable persons, there were two papers presented. You know, uh, taking from statistics about people who are disabled, four points that need our attention. Number one, recognizing the limitations of these people, yeah? Either disabled or the elderly population, we need to recognize the limitations. Number two, providing access that is relevant to them. It is not generic access, but access that is user-friendly, that is usable by this group of people. Number three, we have learned that government need to champion this initiative. It has to be uh, from the government involving others. And number four, uh, use of multi, multiple stakeholders model, right? Involving the government, the private, the NGOs, the academic, the society, the national. So uh, uh, in short, it should be people, public, private, partnership model. So that will sort of help people to get the right access wherever they are at any time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Manyam. That's absolutely, I think, to the point. Multi-stakeholder. No one of us can do it alone. Who goes next? Yes, go. Uh, from the session on uh, digital inclusion and education, I would like, I think there are four points that are critical to be considered here. The first is that understanding of context, assessments are key to better design, deliver, and evaluate ICT-enabled education. So it is just, just about device ownership or access to internet. 
it is also about whether there's an enabling context that allows effective participation in schools. Questions like, do they know how to use technology to learn better, as in the case of the paper from Kenya and Morocco? Or do they have a space at home where they can learn online, like in the case of South Africa? The second point is that we need to reframe discussions on pedagogy. Learning online cannot be done with a face-to-face -face mindset. I mean, it's just like solving 21st century problems with the 19th century thinking. So how do you, con <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> how do you design content online? Cannot be the same as how you design content in a face-to-face -face setup, like in the case of the paper discussing uh, Ethiopia, for example. This requires training on the part of teachers, not only in learning design and delivery, but also in assessment. How, for example, does digital-enabled delivery cater to editorial, tactile, and visual learners? Or how do you design learning syst systems that it re responds to learning needs of people with disabilities and students with learning difficulties? Uh, we know that availability, access to, and affordability of technology is paramount in moving towards technology-enabled education delivery. We know theoretically that the use of technology can enable a more inclusive education, but only when infrastructure is available, when people in remote and difficult situations have access to internet and data costs are affordable, that this, that this, this happens. Finally, in the three researchers on the education panel, we've learned that it's not just about technology. Without capabilities, many of which are non-material and do not relate to technical skills or access alone, and without acknowledgement of the social dynamics of systems and networks, parts of the population always remain excluded. The, because we know that the situation during the pandemic only amplified uh, the underlying forms of inequality. Better connected, better resourced, better capacitated individuals and organizations will benefit better. So the leveling the playing field remains one gigantic challenge. Thank you. Indeed, thank you. Level the playing field. Go ahead, Roberto. Thank you. Um, um, so it's a privilege to represent the uh, job creation uh, session. And I think maybe at least two takeaways. The first one is, and the focus was on smallholder farming mm -hmm. and on SMEs, but really on the micro part of these uh, small uh, entrepreneurial businesses. Uh, the first one is that digital does not immediately translate into jobs. Even though you're connected, doesn't mean uh, it, it automatically creates jobs. Uh, it needs to be more done. Uh, the second one is there's a difference, and this has been discussed for also the other groups, uh, between the urban and the rural. So uh, when COVID happened, actually some of the rural small micro businesses could survive without the, the connection because they were already kind of resilient uh, because they were not always connected, right? So it hit more uh, the urban part, uh, which were much more dependent on um, uh, on uh, also the interaction uh, uh, oh, sorry. On the on the on the uh, on the rule, the interaction was kind of helpful before the physical interaction, which then, of course, uh, was impeded by uh, by COVID. So it was less an issue of digital connectivity, uh, whereas in the urban, um, uh, they had still the connectivity uh, and were then less vulnerable uh, to, uh, uh, because of the physical interaction, which was, of course, because of the curfew, uh, was uh, uh, problematic. So overall, again. Uh, um, access to um, uh, or connectivity access is important, but uh, it needs to be also translated into how you actually create jobs with that. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. One of the things that I think you said that I would like to just um, reiterate is that, yes, being online or having online uh, to be able to access, you know, being capable to go online doesn't mean that you can find a job. So those skills are absolutely needed and you all are it's sitting in universities so i hope you're really helping them produce the right graduates please yeah. okay. um thank you and i think from session five which is on digital connectivity and resilience i think um having infrastructure and giving community networks the right infrastructure isn't like the way the only way but i think um, we need to pay attention to rethinking network management because uh for the for this community uh for these communities to be able to sustain and maintain these networks they need to be very good at managing their networks so um uh from the research, I think um, network management needs, network management interfaces, they need to be uh, 
restructured because they are not usable for locals and they also fail to acknowledge the mesh mesh ways in which communities are trying to like they are trying to integrate um, hardware and software to build working systems out of uh, donated hardware and so this becomes an issue when you have a lot of different branded devices uh, that you received from different organizations and also that you are able to buy from your town or from your city that are accessible to you. So the combination of using all these different devices leads these community networks to have multiple uh, network management interfaces and you do not have adequate training to the use of all of them. And so I think until we address this, uh, there will be a very, very high uh, training barrier to the true ownership of community networks. And this also imposes um, a security uh, concern and some vagaries on how we can use closed source network management uh, systems. Thank you very much. And uh, for all of you who are sitting, I guess, in uh, network management, you know that the more patches or things you put together, the more uh, intricate the manage, um, management dif difficulties you get into. So uh, thanks for um, thinking about that. So second round of questions. Given the recent disruptions caused by COVID-19 pandemic, and it could be really any type of other disruptions. What should be done to improve the connectivity or resilience of networks affect, affecting health, education, job creation, vulnerable people, or communities during such emergencies? Who goes first? Dinalao? Yeah? Okay. Well, <laughs> go ahead, David. <laughs> no worries. Um, Yes, COVID actually taught us the importance of, you know, telemedicine. And I think uh, almost every country benefited from telemedicine uh, during COVID. And, and so you realize that the onus is on various governments to actually put in measures to actually strengthen the telemedicine systems in, in, in um, our respective countries. And so, for instance, um, issues relating to infrastructure cannot be ignored when it comes to telemedicine um, in, in, in Africa, for instance. Um, and so emphasis on infrastructure becomes very key. Um, the emphasis on you know, the language barrier when it comes to communication uh, between the professional and then also uh, uh, those end users is also very key uh, with, with regards to uh, telemedicine. And then also the importance of you know, getting um, a very good fast internet you know, network that actually will benefit people at the base of the pyramid will also help. Uh, I must say that uh, at the professional level, it's not all prof medical professionals, for instance, who are you know, up to rate when it comes to delivering telemedicine. So some capacity building in those areas becomes very important to make sure that we get <coughs> a resilient health system uh, using telemedicine. Thank you, David. I'm going to go to Michael. Yeah, so I was one of the outcomes of this research project, we wrote an article in uh, that Huawei published in its November 22, 22 issue of the online magazine Transform. And it was actually entitled, Truly Inclusive Education Demands Fair Access to Technology. And I think we know that this requires several things. And this is, just, I think, highlighted across all the papers today. Like, for example, in the digital inclusion and education space, when people lack connection or devices or both, governments and even the private sector should strengthen broadband infrastructure and access to learning devices. And policies and programs in higher education should help eliminate the gap in digital infrastructure between public and, pub public and private universities, and also between the capacities of uh, uh, teachers and members of faculty, and also the digital gap among students whose ability to own devices and use the internet is often dependent on their social economic condition. Private companies engaged in ICT should assist in ensuring access to technology by making learning devices more affordable and internet costs more affordable as well. Uh, finally, I think we can take inspiration from resilience as defined in climate change uh, 
literature when we talk about resilient infrastructure. They say that, that resilience is the ability to anticipate, prepare for, and respond to hazardous trends, events, and emergencies. With this and within the context of education and delivery, we will not only think about access to internet, but stability of power sources as well. In South Africa study, for example, a problem that students face is the inability to charge devices. So we will already start about talking about digitizing learning materials to ensure that learning implements are available in the context of emergencies. We also need to continue talking about connecting the connected. I know that we have talked about this for more than 20 years, and there have been a lot of innovations at this front, including, for example, the use of community-based networks presented here, the use of uh, community-based connectivity initiatives, autonomous network infrastructure, or cellular base stations, for example. Scaling and normalizing these innovations, I think, is critical and important. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. I'm glad you, you know, I'm pretty sure a few of you have uh, touched on the subject. Electricity is crucial. You can't have digital without electricity. So that that is one of the things that, for example, you know, at the African Union level here is being tackled really uh, continent wide. So I'm really hoping that uh, some emerging, you know, technologies would come that uh, will make this, um, uh, connecting people really um, meaningful, impactful, but also present because we will have electricity finally, because that's one thing that is also, that not only has to go hand in hand, but is needed on the continent. Thank you. Thanks. Thank um, you. Mania? I would like, what we what was a critical lesson that everyone should have access to internet, regardless, regardless is it e-government or MGAP, whatever, whatever, platform, right? The E should be the small, the, the people should be the bigger. Yeah. That is the first lesson learned. Uh, okay, it's working now. Earlier it was not working. Okay, so that is the first lesson learned that everyone should be given access to internet. In fact, a recent study shows that, you know, through LinkedIn, every eight minutes, they're creating one job opportunity. So that is the power of uh, technology, right? Uh, second point is the based on what my colleague have presented, the ninth SDG point on equal access to uh, information and knowledge to everyone. On that point, so we think and I be believe that access to everyone, it must be relevant, affordable, accessible, usable, it must be empowering and motivating. So that is the lesson learned and pressing matter that need to be given attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Manyan. Uh, Dinero? So, oh, are we uh, sorry, are we in the, I thought it was so, the world is so uncertain and our yes. uh, role was so certain. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> actually, I, th I think there's something in the room and I'm, I think we're not really addressing it and I will try to attempt that. And uh, maybe some of you know Danny Roderick, the uh, Stanford professor, and he said, poor country cannot get rich or more affluent based on market mechanisms alone, right? So what does it mean? It means intervention. And I think, uh, and we discussed it offline uh, in the break, and I think uh, there's something needed really, and it becomes so obvious because the, the next we'll, the next crisis is already looming, you know, whatever it is, and we have one uh, already after COVID. And so we are uncertain. So the first thing I would like to say that the term resilience is important, but uh, what can you be resilient of if you don't know what the next shock is, right? So, so you need, uh, uh, in this fragile moment, I like this term of anti-fragility to really think a little bit out of the box, but still that is not enough to, to leapfrog. And the old, I think the old development model to um, um, where maybe China uh, grew a lot uh, to, to uh, uh, bring uh, rural labor into the industry, basically, right? I think that old model might not work for everyone anymore given that there's a strong automation push, also automation push uh, in all in the rich world, uh, in, in middle income countries, etc. So that's very difficult. So what, I, um, what I'm alluding to is there needs to be a strong empowerment supported uh, by big institutions and by the rich income country uh, to have a knowledge transfer, technology transfer, and also to have uh, more investment availability 
in order to build the networks, etc. So I think that is something which came really uh, uh, out of the, the observation, the, the discussions we had. Uh, and I think these are very important. Yes, on the on the on the national, on the on the micro level, there's all these activities uh, uh, needs to need to continue. But I think uh, as a continent. And what you just said, uh, you know, from the African Union, et cetera, there needs to be more collaboration, coordination towards the multilateral organization, towards the rich world in order to, to tackle climate change, uh, to have more uh, knowledge transfer, technology transfer to technology uh, to, 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 to deal with those issues. And one thing maybe what, where is still a lesson maybe um, from other countries which uh, transitioned fast in the past is uh, to build up the capacity, to build up the knowledge, to build up engineers and all those things uh, where, where this knowledge transfer, when it comes, can also be fruitful and can further uh, develop the, the continent. So that would be my uh, own conclusion a little bit. <laughs> Thank you very much, Orson. Yeah, I actually would have so much to say about all of this. But um, I think one of our uh, uh, guests here would like to say something. So from what you said, please go ahead. And please, I mean, if anybody wants to, you know, chime in on this, I think it would be interesting to have a little bit of discussion instead of us, you know, kind of, uh, you know, pouring stuff on you all. So. Sorry, I'm, I'm disrupting the session a little bit. Please allow me to, because I think it would be important to hear our, our colleagues. Uh, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair, Miss Anna. Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for something and I've, I've not had it. Eh? Uh, because I, I'm really observing that uh, from my experience, uh, the disruptions uh, had both the positive and negative side. And uh, more or less, we, we have really talked so much about uh, the, the negative effects, but we have not been able to see what are these opportunities that perhaps have come up because of these disruptions, because as it were, uh, the same resources that now became idle could be committed to something else. And the same resources that now became overstretched because people shifted their consumption patterns and the broadband consumption pattern to something else, those are the ones to enhance. But the ones that have been left idle, they should be reallocated to something else. Uh, for instance, when you talk about the issue of uh, the mobile data connectivity in our country, where people moved from uh, the fixed data in their offices, uh, what happens to the fixed data which now people will not be able to use when now they move to the, to the mobile? Uh, I think these are things that we need to look at. Then when people now are around that they cannot do physical business and they came up with the e-business e models, e-commerce, we had another gap that now came in the value chain, which is a gap of how to deliver these goods because now uh, the physical people going to shopping is not happening. So we have to have a courier service coming in, which previously had, had been very weak and uh, sometimes an ignored business. But then you find when a gap occurs and there's no formal structure in the policy, so many opportunities come and they establish business that are not regulated and they create a risk to the consumer because the consumer does not know who is this providing the courier services. Perhaps it's somebody who has got other intentions. So we need to, to think broadly now and say, as the disruption occurs, what are the opportunities it's creating as it destroys others? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, who wanted to intervene next? Oh, wow. Well, OK, we're going to have a you know, quite nice. Uh, I'm, I'm going to have you held the, those um, hold this for thoughts until our two other people have spoken, and then we'll see if you know maybe you can wrap it up in the. So please go ahead now. Uh, no, I think it's only Dinola that is left. Thank you. Um, okay, so I think from my side, when it comes to what can be done to improve connectivity and resilience, I think uh, we need uh, to find a way to establish easy to adapt services for local content creation, uh, uh, creation, production, and sharing within the communities, because the more um, the community networks or these communities or not only the infrastructure, but also the content that is being shared on these infrastructures, the more these communities uh, become resilient and the network also becomes the resilient because the uh, content is produced within the community and it's shared on the community infrastructure. And again, on improving connectivity, um, we need to again look at making network management easier 
because the more the community itself can maintain uh, its network fully, the more they are able to troubleshoot their network failures, the more they are able to be on to be able to fix uh, their network failing issues within the community without uh, external reach out, the more the network and the community can be resilient. And I think this can be done by, of course, uh, studying closely what are the devices that are out there that are being used, uh, what is causing the diversity, and also empowering the communities to know what is happening uh, within the network, um, not only uh, to the extent of how, it, how they are using it, but to the background of the technical part of how this community network is standing. Thank you very much, Tindalao. So um, I think one of the one of the crux of this whole discussion has been capacity building. I would like you all to keep in mind or to be reminded that uh, you know in the region we have uh, out of uh, one point almost four billion people right now, uh, practically you know seventy percent that are under twenty five. So uh, we're going to have to have uh, not only the capacity development, but maybe give it a little bit of time. So how do you make sure that, you know, all of this happens? Because, you know, one of the one of the things that I keep hearing here is we, we've got to have the capacity building, but I mean, we've got to build the time for that capacity to come. So meantime, while we're doing that, how do we make sure also that all of this comes to fruition? You are in universities, you are sitting in research centers. I would really like you to think about, you know, that those out of the box, you know, uh, thinking, because uh, no matter if we do all of the capacity building that we can right now, today, we're not gonna be able to have everybody out there working towards what we want, okay? So this is just to say one, you know, as um, uh, some of us have said here, while we are looking at the solutions, we need to also really think about putting the time to make sure it's done right, all right? So one of the things that uh, I would like you to think, to keep in mind is also give it the time, truly, because we're not gonna do this overnight. And uh, I think we're often caught up in the sense that there is an urgency to do things, but um, is it really an urgency to do if we wanna be sustainable? And if we wanna really get where we want to get in between not having electricity, having very young population that we need to educate that is going to take a little bit of time and all of that. So just keep that in mind. And uh, I'll give the floor to the person who's in the back there and then the two others here, please. You had a question or a comment? There was somebody, yeah? Yes. Oh, oh well, you need to come to the front so everybody can hear okay, you. Okay, thank you, Chairman. <laughs> yes, uh, go ahead. Um, I, Part of my takeaway, particularly from the research front, is, and which some of my colleagues have shared here today, is for us not just to look at the three A's of ICTs, but for, for us, we're totally looking at the five A's of ICTs. If it must be sustainable and all of that, and that five A's to us is actually availability, accessibility, affordability, but we overlook not adoption and adaptability of some of this technology. Uh, you get it particularly on auxiliary, I mean, auxiliary systems, support systems that um, supports some of the solutions we provide. I give a typical example, um, which we're able to solve through re reverse engineering. I'm going to withhold the name of the UPS we had to use to augment fluctuation of power in our environment. But because of the way it is designed, it has not been done in such a way to adapt to the kind of spikes you have on uh, to power engineers. They may understand that. You get it because a typical um, alternating you know, 
current should be 220 plus or minus 10 volt. But you have spikes, or what I call dirty spikes. And when the tyristors of the power, um, 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 UPS sees it, the fuse goes, the tyristor goes. And before you know it, within a month, the battery bat, and the system becomes useless. And over time, we just decide to like, you know, have data trained on why this is always so. And we just realize that the fuse and the tyristors of this high power UPS in the range of five kV, um, 10 kV, is not adaptable to the kind of spikes we have in our environment. So what we did is to move that fuse system to it about from five amps to six, eight amps, you get it. Then of course, the tyristor too, you get it. Um, 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 and before you know it, we're having that UPS system adopting the kind of power that we have in Africa, or in particular in Nigeria, you get it, with spikes issue. So that's why for us, we think, just like you mentioned, Ma, the issue of electricity, yes, we, have, we must have to take time, but we must make do with what we have available to us. If we can power a communication that like 36,000 kilometers away from at, so I see no reason, that was what we asked ourselves, I see no reason why we can make use of the abundance of sun energy in Africa. You get it to provide green energies to power some of these things. You get it. And at a, even a cheaper solution. So for us, you get it. I think part of our takeaway is to continue to look at five A's and part of that adaptation and adaptability of technologies is reverse engineering to get things off the ground. Thank you. Thank you very much. Five A's. Keep that in mind. I actually hope that you're working with the IEEE Africa region uh, group. If not, we need to talk because they're actually looking at that, uh, especially the electricity part. So um, next, who was next? Here, here, and then, yes, there. Yeah, sorry, I'll be very quick. It's, it's not really a, a, a contribution, but it's mostly a question because you have very good speakers there. So I just wanted to, and then the previous speaker also emphasized uh, some of my points, but I wanted to talk about education adaptability, but mostly um, on the aspect of time, because we are talking about digital availability, digital divide, but we are trying to deal with uh, the challenges that we have now and the technology that we have now. But what about the future also? So I think we have also to think about it because I'm probably sure I'm among the youngest person here, but uh, in a few years I will be old, but I don't want to be excluded of the digital ecosystem because I'm old. So we need also now to think about it because I'm sure that uh, we see, for example, on social media, most of us, we have we are on Facebook, LinkedIn, this kind of thing. But young people on high school are on TikTok, this kind of thing. And they are doing many different things there. And there is different social ecosystem there. So for us, if we don't think about it now uh, in our solution that, I mean, policy regulation technology that we are developing now, we have to think about the future. I really want to hear um, from you about this. And then the second aspect is also, about, uh, yeah, we're talking about technology, but maybe I'm out of the topic, but I think also we should see what would happen if, for example, we have a solar eruption and all these things turn out. What will happen? If we switch on 100% technologies, uh, healthcare, education, this kind of thing, what will happen if we have this kind of outage? So I really want to hear from you. Sorry, it's just question. I always have questions. But uh, yeah, I really want to hear from you about this thing. Two, two points. Do we have to switch from digital-based solution to low-tech solution and not tech solution, be more innovative? It just, it's just a question here. So yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I love the questions. Um, and uh, who would like to take... Um, these because uh, these are absolutely important, I think. Yes, no? Well, um, I'm going to tell you one thing that I know. There is a country that is uh, very, very, very connected, who right now is printing on gazillion millions of paper everything that is digital. Why? Because of what he just talked about, solar flares. 
that can actually, yes, in a few seconds, wipe everything, <laughs> you know, that we have in terms of networks. And I would like to, as he said, you know, it is part of uh, really not only the adaptability, you know, but uh, going forward, it is one of the things that we're going to have to think about. It is important while we're going digital, it is important to make sure that uh, the redundancy as a networks is built in there in terms of making sure that if something happens to those networks, we can actually still function. It is crucial indeed. And I love the other question. Me, I'm getting to what they call, you know, the persons with special needs. <laughs> yes. Older people are actually part of this whole process. And it's, it is true that oftentimes while we're thinking about young people and uh, uh, adults in general, uh, if you look at uh, even developed countries today uh, and the way they have gone online, we have a lot of pe uh, older people who have, left on, who have been left on the side because they can't really uh, do their banking anymore online. Or when you say, oh, we're all, we're all going you know, banking online, then they, they don't know how to access it. Or when they go, um, they get scammed the next second and they don't ever want to come back online. So you have a full, you know, um, part of the population that is truly, truly left behind. We don't want that. So, you know, those are also questions of adaptability and all of that, that we really need to keep in mind. Each one of us here, no matter how young you are, is a person with special needs as we grow up. Either it's with this, it's with the hearing, it is, yes, with maybe, you know, as we're not seeing properly, you know, the technologies that would allow us to still do this, you know, um, uh, whether we're, um, we, we have uh, any type of disabilities uh, at all, you know. So uh, we need to keep that in mind as we go. And uh, with those words, I would like to thank our panel and thank all of you for sticking the whole day with us today and making it a wonderful one, truly. I really hope that um, we have learned from each other and um, that uh, we actually are going to not only work together, but make sure that uh, we cater to everybody and at all levels as we go in terms of digital transformation. It is important that we keep in mind that we're not doing it only for today. We're not doing it, uh, you know, for tomorrow. It is about making sure that uh, that meaningfulness, that uh, sustainability is really for the long term and at all levels. So thank you very much for today and for making it meaningful for, for all of us you know, ITU and all of our partners, Huawei, the governments who have all helped us to come here, and you who have actually accepted to participate by being part of this competition. So thank you all. Can I just ask you know, to give a big round of applause for the leadership and providing us the direction and the vision for NHL. Thank you, NHL, for being there supporting us. Thank you.